To us, the environment in which fish dwell often seems cold, dark, and mysterious. But there are advantages to living in water, and they've played an important role in making fish what they are. One is that water isn't subject to sudden temperature changes; therefore, it makes an excellent habitat for a cold-blooded animal. Another advantage is the water's ability to easily support body weight. Protoplasm has approximately the same density as water, so a fish in water is almost weightless. This weightlessness, in turn, means two things. One, a fish can get along with a light weight and simple bone structure, and two, limitations to a fish's size are practically removed. Yet there is one basic difficulty to living in water: the fact that it's incompressible. For a fish to move through water, it must actually shove it aside. Most can do this by wiggling back and forth in snake-like motion. The fish pushes water aside by the forward motion of its head and with the curve of its body and its flexible tail. Next, the water flows back along the fish's narrowing sides, closing in at the tail and helping the fish propel itself forward. The fact that water is incompressible has literally shaped the development of fish. A flat and angular shape can be moved through water only with difficulty. And for this reason, fish have a basic shape that is beautifully adapted to deal with this peculiarity. We are going to start Chapter Three today. The chapter is on cave paintings. Who can tell us about cave paintings? The drawings are mostly of animals. Correct. The animals are mostly bison, horses, and deer. The most common themes in cave paintings are large wild animals such as bison, horses, aurochs, and deer. Anthropologist Abby Bruill interpreted the paintings as being hunting magic. That is to say, they were meant to increase the number of animals. Drawings of humans are rare and are usually schematic rather than the more naturalistic animal subjects. Who can guess when cave painting started? Prehistoric times. Yes, the paintings were made during the Upper Paleolithic, about forty thousand years ago. Let me ask you another question: Who drew the paintings? Artists. Good answer. But who were the artists? What were their positions? Tribal leaders. Close, but incorrect. The artists were believed to be respected elders or shamans. The main colors of the paintings were limited to yellow, brown, charcoal, red, hematite, and manganese oxide.
If you like the colorful animals we just saw, you're going to love these next animals, frogs. You might not normally think of frogs as being colorful, but these frogs definitely are. They are the dart poison frogs of Central and South America. Look at their striking colors, often yellow with black stripes or deep blue with black spots. Beyond being nice to look at, these markings have a purpose. They warn predators that these frogs are poisonous. When threatened, these frogs secrete a substance through their skin that would easily kill whatever animal might try to eat them. Their bright colors communicate this, and so most animals tend not to hunt them. Now, speaking of hunting, for centuries these frogs were sought after by hunters. As you might think, the hunters didn't want to eat the frogs, but rather they captured them for their poison. They would add the poison to the tips of their hunting arrows. Of course, nowadays most hunters use guns. These days, dart poison frogs are of less interest to hunters than to medical researchers. Researchers believe that they can make new heart medicine from the poison because it acts as a stimulant on the body's nervous system. Researchers think they could use it to stimulate a weak heart. There is, however, a problem with doing research on these frogs. Those that are caught in the wild will produce their poison until they die. However, those that are born in captivity, like the ones you see here, will not produce any poison at all. The men of the North Woods tribes were the hunters. The hunting season began in the fall and continued until midwinter. These expeditions frequently took the hunters away from the village for long periods of time. Moose, deer, beaver, bear, and elk were the animals sought. Large deer drives were common, and small animals were taken with snares or the bow and arrow. Did the women ever go hunting with the men? The women often accompanied their husbands on hunting parties. Their job was to take charge of the camps. Do you mean they just cooked for the men? I thought the Native Americans had more of a system of equality. Overall, men and women shared the labor. On hunting expeditions, women basically supported the men whose job was to procure the game. On the other hand, women controlled other realms of life. For example, women managed all of the agricultural operations. Also, a woman headed each clan, and these women were respected for their role as keepers of the clan. Listen to part of a talk in an introductory art class. The professor is talking about choosing a career in the arts. Before you undertake a career in the arts, there are a number of factors to consider. Whether your goal is to be an actor or an animator, a saxophonist or a sculptor, talent is an essential consideration. But talent alone won't guarantee a successful career in the arts. You also need training, experience, and self-discipline. Most importantly, however, you should realize that a career in the arts requires a personal sense of commitment, a 
calling. Because art does have a history of insecure employment. A lot of artists find it difficult, even impossible, to live on the money they make from their art. Most have to supplement their income by teaching or by working behind the scenes or by doing other work not related to the arts. In your opinion, what's the best way for us to know if we really have a calling to art? Well, those of you who are interested in art as a career should talk with arts professionals or work in the arts yourselves. Professionals can give good first-hand advice, but experience is the best way to get a feel for the field. What kind of experience? I mean, how do we get started? Experience doesn't have to be formal. It can be part-time or volunteer work. For example, if you want to be a photographer or graphic designer, you could work for your school newspaper. Or, if your interest is acting, you could start out in community theater. The important thing is getting started, spending time doing something in your chosen medium. Number five. The Golden Age of American Agriculture. Listen to part of a lecture in a history class, then answer the question. We call the first two decades of the 20th century the Golden Age of American Agriculture. What were the factors that made the period the Golden Age of American Agriculture? Who can offer some reasons? New strains of crops, improved farming methods, and... What about greater use of pesticides and fertilizers? Absolutely. Technical advances continue to improve productivity. The U.S. Department of Agriculture set up demonstration farms to show how new techniques could improve crop yields. In 1914, Congress created the Agricultural Extension Service to advise farmers and their families about everything from crop fertilizers to home sowing projects. The Department of Agriculture undertook new research, developing hogs that fattened faster on less grain, as well as fertilizers that increased grain production, new hybrid seeds that developed into healthier plants, treatments that prevented or cured plant and animal diseases, and various methods for controlling pests were all introduced around this time. Anything else? Wasn't there also some kind of population boom around then? Good. Farm prices were high as demand for goods increased and land values rose. However, the good years of the early 20th century ended following World War I. What was happening then? Maybe a lot of people, women especially, were moving from the farm to the cities. A lot of people just don't feel quite human without that morning cup of coffee. Now a study finds that the enhanced sense of well-being that caffeine can cause is reflected in our perception of words. Specifically, caffeine increases the ability to recognize words associated with positive thoughts, but doesn't quite provide the same boost for words with negative or even neutral associations. The research is in the journal PLOS One. Scientists assigned 66 subjects to one of two groups. Half got a 200 milligram caffeine tablet, a dose equal to almost three cups of coffee. The other half received a sugar tablet. 30 minutes later, the volunteers were shown strings of letters and had to decide as fast as they could if a string formed a word or was just gibberish. The volunteers recognized words with positive associations much, much faster than either negative or neutral words. Other studies have shown that positive words tend to be recognized more quickly, but the caffeine increases the gap. So next time you wake up with a grumpy sweetheart, your compliments might be appreciated more if they have a cup of coffee first.
What's the first thing you do when you get to a hotel room? Turn on the light, kick off your shoes, and turn on the tube? If so, congratulations! You've likely just made a quick tour of the places in the room that harbor the most bacteria. Sure, there are a lot of bacteria in the bathroom, but that's not the hottest spot for bugs. Some of the highest concentrations of microbes were on the light switch, the carpet, and the television remote. The findings were presented at the American Society for Microbiology's 2012 general meeting. The researchers sampled 18 surfaces from nine hotel rooms in three different states. They found that 81% of those surfaces had at least some fecal bacteria on them. But of course, not all of these bugs are going to make you sick. The study was in part to help inform cleaning protocols. Some hotel chains are already pledging to keep their properties a little more germ-free, so your next day might be a little cleaner. Just don't investigate CSI style with a black light. You'll never be able to sleep. I think what, what is most remarkable about Dexter is his capacity for stress management. Michael C. Hall, in a conversation about his TV character at the Rubin Museum of Art in New York City on October 24th, he spoke with psychologist Kevin Dutton, author of The Wisdom of Psychopaths. And, and I think that's, that's because of his ability to, as the heat goes up, his... Absolutely internal temperature goes down. Yeah, he, yeah. He, the, the crazier things get, the cooler he feels. He almost craves chaos. He, he seems to attract it, cultivate it, mm. encourage it, because it's the only thing that somehow soothes him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's very realistic, actually, because what you find is it, that the more chaotic a situation, the more that psychopaths have to make decisions under pressure. Uh, the better their decision making gets, and we've seen it with Dexter, the more the, the, the pressure builds, the cooler he gets. And that is exactly what you see with psychopaths, it really is. The human race is spread all over the world, from the polar regions to the tropics. The people of whom it is made up eat different kinds of food, partly according to the climate in which they live, and partly according to the kind of food which their country produces. In hot climates, meat and fat are not much needed, but in the Arctic regions, they seem to be very necessary for keeping up the heat of the body. Thus, in India, People live chiefly on different kinds of grains, eggs, milk, or sometimes fish and meat. In Europe, people eat more meat and less grain. In the Arctic regions, where no grains and fruits are produced, the Eskimo and other races live almost entirely on meat and fish. Knowledge of the inheritance of characteristics, 
has been implicitly used since prehistoric times for improving crop plants and animals through selective breeding. However, the modern science of genetics, which seeks to understand the mechanisms of inheritance, only began with the work of Gregor Mendel in the mid-19th century. Although he did not know the physical basis for the heredity, Mendel observed that inheritance is fundamentally a discrete process, where specific traits are inherited in an independent manner. These basic units of inheritance are now called genes. Although genetics plays a large role in determining the appearance and behavior of organisms, it is the interactions of genetics with the environment and organism experiences that determines the ultimate outcome. For example, while genes play a role in determining a person's height, the nutrition and health that person experiences in childhood also have a large effect. Genetics, a discipline of biology, is the science of heredity and variation in living organisms. It is not often I get the chance to talk about the psychology of pop music, or rather the lyrics and the effect they have on young people. I must say at the outset that I'm not at all sure about the findings of a recent survey I've been studying, conducted over a period of 30 years. In short, it claims that late adolescents and college students are more narcissistic than ever before. This might well be true, and it might also be true that pop lyrics are becoming more self-absorbed, negative, and violent. But this might reflect the psychology of the writers and performers more than their listeners. Also, as the writers of the study are alarmed to discover, this radical increase in narcissism comes with higher levels of loneliness and depression, which, if you think about it for a second, is hardly surprising. Furthermore, they have detected a link with heightened anger and problems maintaining relationships. Now, a couple of points. First, adolescents are pretty much self-absorbed anyway, but it's rarely pathological. Also, you can read almost anything you want into song lyrics from any era. Again, people nowadays find it easier to express themselves emotionally than their counterparts did 30 years ago. Last, the survey suggests a complete personality change over the period covered. Yet I doubt that personality traits can change so much from one generation to another, or for that matter, from one culture to another. How would you define reasonable as it is used in law? For example, you are allowed to use reasonable force when defending yourself. It seems to depend on how serious the situation was, whether it was possible to resolve it by peaceful means, whether you were ready to try those means, and, finally, the relative strengths of those involved. Now, most men know, and they've probably grasped this from their earliest years in the school playground, that when it comes to blows, fights don't stop until one of you is in no shape to do any damage to the other. The criteria mentioned seem a bit fuzzy to me. How can you convince a jury you were ready to try and talk your way out of it when the other person would have none of it? And besides, he was quick to land the first punch. 
Also, you can strike the first blow and still plead self-defence. Of course, you again have the problem of convincing people that the threat was so great that you had no alternative apart from getting beaten up yourself. Reacting calmly and rationally to a perceived threat is not easy to do. The body of the worker bee is divided into three segments, head, thorax, and abdomen. On the head are the mandibles, the jaw-like organs which enable the bees to perform the necessary hive duties and to mold the wax and build their combs. The honey bee's four wings and six legs are fastened to the thorax. Located in the abdomen are the honey sac and the sting with its highly developed poison sac. The sting is used by the workers for self-defense and for the protection of their colony. The worker uses her sting only once, for in doing so, she... Psychology is a relatively new science. Like other sciences, psychology must be able to state laws. A law is a way of organizing knowledge about something so that we can make predictions. When enough knowledge is gained about a subject, a scientist can state precisely what will happen under certain conditions. We experimental psychologists are interested in developing laws about human behavior, so we'll be able to understand and predict what people do and why they do it. Of course, to develop laws about human behavior, we must assume there's some regularity to it. We can't be psychologists without making the assumption that behavior follows. That grinning, glowing, globular invader of your living room is an inhabitant of the pumpkin patch, and if your doorbell rings and nobody's there, that was no Martian, it's Halloween. That's how Orson Welles ended his Mercury Theater version of H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds on October 30th, 1938. The broadcast was designed to sound like live news coverage of an invasion of Earth by Martians, and a lot of people fell for it. Now there's some more Martian misinformation fooling folks. This one's not so scary. A lot of people are getting email claiming that in the next few weeks, the planet Mars will get close enough to the Earth so that it will appear to be about the same size as the moon. Our friends at Sky and Telescope magazine report that email dating back to 2003 mentioned that in a 75 times magnifying telescope, Mars would look about as big as the moon does to the naked eye. Somewhere along the line, the telescope part got lost. So don't worry, Mars, even at its closest, is still small and safely far away. It's Halloween.
If you ever get an infection of the cornea and you wear contact lenses, save the lenses. They could help your doctor figure out what medication would be the best bet to cure what ails you. Wearing contacts is associated with an increased risk of microbial keratitis or corneal eye infection. Such an infection can sometimes lead to complications that might threaten your sight. Doctors will take a scraping from the cornea and then try to identify whatever organisms are present. But in a study reported in the September issue of Archives of Ophthalmology, only 34% of corneal scrapings from contact lens wearing keratitis patients allowed researchers to identify the microbes involved. But 70% of contact lenses from the affected patients harbored microbes. The study included 49 patients with a total of 50 infected eyes seen at a hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Said one of the study's authors, contact lens culture may give a clue regarding the identity of the causative organism in situations in which the corneal scraping is culture negative and may help in choosing the appropriate antimicrobial agent. It's not easy being yellow. Bananas now face two separate fungal epidemics which threaten to pluck the fruit off of our tables. Fortunately, researchers have now sequenced banana DNA, producing the genome of a banana variety that may hold the secret to defeating the diseases. The report is in the journal Nature. Today, half of all bananas, including the ones you probably buy, belong to the Cavendish variety, whose popularity stems in part from having no seeds. But this trait also removes sexual reproduction from the equation. The bananas are thus all genetically identical and identically vulnerable to the two fungal epidemics, Panama disease and black leaf streak disease. Researchers sequenced the genome of a banana variety called D.H. Pahang, whose genes contributed to the Cavendish. While the genome shows where this fruit fits in the history of plant evolution, it could also help researchers understand why D.H. Pahang, unlike its descendant, is resistant to the funguses behind both Panama and black leaf streak disease. Knowing the genes responsible for this resistance could help breeders create stronger, more resistant bananas, which has a lot of appeal. The theater will be held at the concert hall. There is no much interconnection between philosophy and psychology. We have sophisticated ways to study in brain activity.